When you say you had a drink with Priscilla, let's be clear about yeah. this. What did you say? Uh, how are you doing? Uh, can I can I buy you a drink? I mean, what were the circumstances here? You know, I approached the table and uh, uh, and I said hello, and she looked at me and she said, uh, "Yeah, two glasses of uh, red wine and a martini, please." <laughs> uh, I, I, you know, I think that counts as having a drink, doesn't it? Hey, there he is. Hello. Uh, hey. So this is what a. A YouTube channel looks like. I've never been in one. Yeah. Welcome. For, from my point of view, it's a very hot room at the top of a house. Uh, well, mine's a living room that uh, we call the living room. <laughs> it's got some musical instruments in it. There's a piano, there's a couple of guitars and stuff. So my son plays. How old is your son? He's 14. Oh, so how has that been in these strange times? Do you know what? Not bad. Oh, actually. I don't. I don't want to hear that. You've got numerous children at home, which changes the equation somewhat. It's easier to wrangle one cat. People that have the one child always strike me as they're this really tight unit. I think parents with one child, you could sit an exam on that child. You know everything about that child. I notice that when I, I catch up with friends and they say, "How's?" How's Emma? Oh, she's done this, she's doing that. Whereas if you ask me, I say, well, yeah, yeah I, I think they're around. <laughs> Have you found yourself becoming more like your father or more unlike your father? More like my father, but, but in ways that are so spooky, given that I am 55, so I've not lived with my father for more than 35 years, but I have so many of his mannerisms that it's almost like, you know, God, if there is a God, is having a laugh at my expense. Yes, I know what you mean. The thing is that, you know, I come from a Hindu background, so we have lots of gods. So there is a kind of mass mocking, because uh, <laughs> it's a whole pantheon of deities that, that are smirking and sniggering <laughs> and, and humiliating you. So what you're telling me then is that you found lockdown a stress-free occasion it's not been too bad i mean the thing is you do count your blessings and the key to getting through it and through things like this is to feel lucky not to prove that you're lucky but to feel it and that can be based on whatever you want it to be it can be based on you know your family where you live you know those kind of things but it can also be based on moments i think for me particularly as i started late in in this career is that I always go back to being, I guess, my son's age, about 14 or 15, and thinking of the posters that were on my bedroom wall, and then realising uh, how many of those I've met. That's exactly, that's, that's exactly how I look at life, Sanj. If I get a bad review, right, I still go, yeah, but I've met Billy Connolly. <laughs> exactly that. You were in marketing, right, so that's mm. an unusual place to then go on. I was a shopping channel presenter. So just anything <laughs> after that is winning. <laughs> but also, well, these things are relative, aren't they? So, you know, you being a, a shopping channel presenter, you know, that would be like being in a Scorsese film for someone somewhere. Yeah, at the time, when, when I got the gig, I was living in Cardiff, and I knew, okay, shopping channel, not really what I wanted to do, but there was another part going, oh, there are cameras and it's in London. I wonder what it could lead on to. Well, unemployment, it turns out, but I didn't know that then. For me, in terms of interacting with you know, broadcast technology in some way, was volunteering at my local hospital for their hospital radio. There was a guy there uh, who, who I replaced on the kind of film music show, and he was an actor, and I was just in awe of this guy. And he left because he was doing a UK tour of Fireman Sam. And I don't think I've yet to this day, been more envious of anyone doing anything. <laughs> I mean, I can say now that there are, seriously are things that I learnt on the shopping channel, basic things about selling something that I still keep to this day. Are there things from marketing that have helped in your performing career? Yeah, definitely. The, the main one is that I kind of realised that to most people who are going to hire me. I'm a product. And it slightly insulated me from not getting a job yeah. as some sort of personal rejection because it was, well, 
this product wasn't what they were looking for. I'm often keen to find out when I don't get something. You're right. There are lots of reasons. For me, it's often the same reason we didn't think you were very good. <laughs> now, look, I can see behind you. Is that you in, in Thunderbirds? That is, yes. That is um, the first uh, Thunderbird puppet that was made in 50 years. So they, uh, a few years ago, they did. Uh, they were celebrating the, uh, the anniversary for, of, of Thunderbirds, and uh, they had audio adventures on record that they'd never put images to. Yeah. And so there was a, a, a group of people who were passionate about it, who basically recreated uh, the puppets, the you know the Thunderbird, the flying machines themselves. And uh, one of the characters was called Gallop Din. <laughs> He uh, uh, was, um, you know, an international rescue agent based in the Himalayas that Lady Penelope and Parker go and uh, interact with. So they needed a puppet for it. And they got in touch because they knew I was a Thunderbirds fan and said, you know, would you mind if we modeled one on you? Because they had a tradition in, in the Jerry Anderson stuff of, of basing their puppets on people. The weird thing was, because it was the original audio, the person who was doing the voice of Parker did the Indian accent for Gallup Din, and they did say to me, look, you know, this is the audio, if you have any objection. I said, no, it's of its time, so. Yeah, I've got a, I've got a character in Perspex as well. That's from um, a thing called uh, Early Man. Oh yeah, And I yeah. voiced that character. This is a delicate bit of engineering. Yeah, wouldn't it be hilarious if we both dropped them at the same time and they broke? Yeah. <laughs> now, my, my character was called the Message Bird, who would deliver a message mimicking whoever did the voice in a very unpolitically correct way in 2020. Yours was David Graham narrating him. His voice was something akin to, Oh, Lady Penelope, what a wonderful thing it is to have you here in the Himalaya. Ah! There you go. That's that, brilliant. That was worth the price of admission, wasn't it, Sanj? <laughs> I always felt you and I could have been friends. <laughs> I see you at things and we, and we have a chat, but this is probably going to be the longest conversation we've ever had. I think you're right. I think... In, you, you know, know, you know when like... you paused then, I thought for a minute, I thought, you know, but don't you remember, Rob, we went out for dinner that time. I, I thought the pause might kind of suggest thoughtfulness and sincerity. <laughs> yeah, I agree with you. We could have been friends. Well, I think what might have been, you know, if... <laughs> because we have in common a love for a person and he's there on your chest from the 68 special. Yeah, the Elvis thing. When did you first get into Elvis? I think when I was about three, three or four years old. Wow. And it was hearing his voice, actually. And, uh, you know, and as a kid, I guess as a three or four year old, you know, songs like Teddy Bear are the ones that you kind of like are drawn to because, you know, there's... It, it's a part of your world yeah. at that point. And, uh, <laughs> he's ta he's talking about the subjects that matter to you. Yes, I got stung. I mean, you know, <laughs> I did... I got stung. I understand this. Frank Skinner famously bought a shirt that he hoped <laughs> was worn by Elvis. Have you deployed your vast wealth that you've collected through your career? Have you bought any Elvis stuff? Um, no. <laughs> I used my vast wealth to feed the hungry. You uh, have one give... child. Now, come on. You can't make out like you're, you're, you're being... Or, or are you talking about your general charitable work? No, no. I mean, that one child eats a lot. <laughs> I don't have anything that he owned. I, I used to think I'd like to, and it's always coming up in auction, whether it's a ring or sunglasses or shirts. But you'd, you'd never be sure, would you? No, it's like socks, isn't it? I mean, the thing is that, you know, someone could say these are Elvis's socks. And I don't know how, you know, how long you would go with it before you began, began to doubt yourself. Can I offer up to you Ronnie Tut's drumsticks? Well, that's amazing. This is playing with Neil Diamond. Mm. I did a show with Neil Diamond and Ronnie was on the drums and I think he knew because I'd asked him about Elvis and stuff, you know. And as he came, came off the stage at the London Palladium, having played Sweet Caroline with these and Crackling Rosie, and as he walked past me, he gave them to me. That's amazing. A month later, I got an invoice from him. <laughs> which I wasn't expecting. And for me, kind of took some of the edge off it. 
<laughs> I, I, I can go back to lots of relationships that have a very similar end. <laughs> uh, I met Connie Cutt last year. You met him last year? I met him and James Burton ah. and Ben Hardin. I mean, amazing just to be around. See, this goes back to the kind of, you know, the, the young teen selves of ours. Yeah, yeah. And you kind of go, I, it's, you know, if I don't get a job, if I audition for something, I didn't get it. I kind of go, do you know what? I met, you know, I've met Priscilla, you know, a few times and had a drink with her. I had a martini with Priscilla. I remember ex the exact drinks. But for me, my perfect moment was being at this gig. And there were only about 20 people there. And some of the Rolling Stones were there. Frank Skinner was there. We were watching Scotty Moore and DJ Fontana play music, play drums. And there were people who were getting up. So Ronnie Wood got up and played with them. And uh, Gary Bonds got up and played with them. And one of the organizers came up to me and said, this is incredible, isn't it? And I said, yeah, I mean, this is, I mean, they've just played Hound Dog. I mean, these are the guys that played it. And she said, do you, um, do you want to get up and sing with them? <laughs> I said, no. But being asked was a perfect moment. Because Frank, Frank did get up and, ah, and he sang. Them. Well done, he Frank. Was, he was out of tune, he was out of time. <laughs> Yeah, right. I'm in. I'll do it. What, what is it? Count me in. One, two, three. I got stung. <laughs> this is the, the kind of route, the conduit to me meeting Priscilla. It's a book by Jerry Schilling. Oh, Jerry Schilling, um, yeah. I think he was the youngest of the entourage. Um, and uh, Jerry became a friend. I interviewed him for uh, TCM. When you met when you met Priscilla the couple of times, did you get a photograph with her? I got a photograph the last time. Yeah, the first time was at a hotel. It was really late. And Jerry said uh, Priscilla was going to join us in the bar. He went off to kind of find her. So I was in the bar on my own and Priscilla walked in and she came over to me and said, hi, are you Jerry's friend? And I said, yes. And so we sat and chatted for about 20 minutes before Jerry came back. The worst thing about it, was I was sitting there thinking, can I mention Elvis? <laughs> <laughs> and so there was that stupid thing of her saying, uh, how are you? And I said, yeah, I'm fine. And I said, is your hotel room nice? Is it comfortable? I mean, is the bathroom? How's that? How big is the bathroom? It was just stupid, inane, I can't mention Elvis, until she mentioned it. And yeah, then yeah, I thought, yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, permission. Okay, permission well, 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 look. I met her a few years ago for a Radio 2, I did an, an interview with her. I had a photograph mm. taken with her. So here's what we'll do. We should finish this interview almost with a press your red button now moment where we'll put up the photo of you and Priscilla, the photo of me and Priscilla. I'm gonna find some way for the viewer to vote on which photo looks most like Priscilla with Elvis. It doesn't have to be a looks thing, it could just be a vibe, you know, an, an earthy sensuality. And I should say you've got a good chance of winning because in mine, from memory, you remember Tex Avery, the cartoonist? Remember the wolf he used to draw? Yes. I, I think I look more like that than Elvis. In my one, from what I remember, I look like a bovine Tex Avery character. So. <laughs> Sanj, thank you so much. This has been lovely. We will leave people now with two images of two men in their prime stood next to Priscilla Presley. And with that, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>